Well, good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to this work session of the Lakota Board of Education. Jenny, would you please call roll? Mrs. Casper? Here. Mrs. O'Connor? Here. Mrs. Schaefer? Here. Mrs. Schaefer? Here. Mrs. Yeah, that's okay. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So leads us into our first topic for the work session this evening. We're going to be getting an update on the master's master facility. Yeah, switching that? Yes, okay, sir. just kidding. Um, we're going to be starting, that's okay. We're going to be starting this evening with a student achievement update from our early childhood schools. <coughs> Mrs. French. I'm getting no audio at all from anybody. No audio at all from anybody. Oh. <laughs> all right, Mrs. French. Thank you. And thank you all for having me. For those of you that I don't know, my name is Christina French. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Instruction for our K-6 students. And I am here tonight to share with you what has been happening with our littlest learners in our early childhood schools. So we have really tried to mold the things that we're doing to fall under our strategic plan. So I kind of made the presentation to fall under the goals of our strategic plan. So. First, we'll start with we are personalized. Oops. So one of the things that we have really been focusing on this year with our K-2 students is work on phonics. So we have heard a lot from our community. We've been meeting with some of our community members who have younger children and children who have moved through the program already. And we've taken a look at a lot of our test data to try to figure out where we can grow. And phonics keeps coming back to us as one of those things. So let's take a look at what our data is telling us right now and what has led us really to focus on phonics. So last year, and we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this in just a second. Last year, we began working on phonics workshop with our students. So we had reading workshop and we had writing workshop, but we were really missing that connection in between. So we determined we were missing that connection by taking a look at some of our writing data that was coming back from um, our map data, and then also our Ohio State tests in third grade, which would then mark the progress of our second graders. So eight of our eight elementary schools, since we have started this program, have increased in the number of students who are marked as above the average. And six of our eight have decreased in the number of students below the average. So I think what we're doing is working. Um, we've been really strategic around how we are providing professional development for our teachers and um, moving into our classrooms and being watching what the students are doing within the classroom. Um, our third grade reading guarantee, what we do is we, t they, the, our third grade students take a test in the fall. It's the Ohio State test that they get to take two times. The first time's in the fall. So that fall test is really a mark of achievement on their second grade year when we're testing it. So that's kind of where we're looking at that data. Um, this year, we've had 41.6% of our second graders move to on track in the fall of third grade. So they took the test in the fall of second grade, they took it again in the fall of third grade, and by the time th the fall of third grade came, they moved on track. We currently have 225 students who are off track in third grade, which is a comparison to last year's 265. Last, or in 18-19, we had 16 students retained under the third grade reading guarantee, and last year we had eight. So some of the work that we are doing around phonics, we're going back, we're trying to fill in the holes that were missed in their kindergarten and first grade years to really launch them into looking more closely at that fluency and comprehension. 
So as I said before, one of the ways that we've been doing that is with Phonics Workshop. So it is um, kind of the, it's a quick 20 minute connector that goes between reading workshop and writing workshop. And then the work, so they do a quick 20 minute lesson, but then the work happens during reading and writing. So there's no specific phonics lessons that they're doing. They're doing a quick learn and then they build it right into what they're doing in reading and writing. Um, so it's that 15 minute bridge lesson that carries those two things together. We also were, we sent our instructional specialist to Columbia last summer, which is where that program is founded. And they received tra training directly from Columbia so that they're in the building supporting our teachers every day. Uh, they're in the classrooms, they're modeling lessons, they're walking them through professional development. Um, and then we also, started looking at our tier two and tier three support. So some of those kids that we talked about that are off track, we're doing some really intentional specific things with them to move them on track, such as Foundation for Literacy and Phonics First. So those are kind of smaller group focuses for those students. Um, we have also kept a really close connection with our dyslexia parent group. They really have a lot of insight on what that looks like for students and where some of that struggle is. So we've gotten a lot of feedback from them on building this program too. The other thing that we've been doing that falls under the We Are Personalized is we've really taken an inquiry-based learning approach in social studies. Those of you that kind of keep up on Twitter and, and things in the district, you've seen a lot of tweets come out about this and they're all hashtagged inquire ed. And that is the organization that we're working with in order to do that. So inquiry-based learning really in a nutshell is a program that really focuses on student interest, student passion, and then building the standards into that as they're learning and going. So it's really um, built around community exploration and experience and it's real world learning. So you wonder about how the fire hose is made on a fire truck. Let's find out and we're gonna build those community standards in there to what, you, what the students are learning in the classroom. Um, so with this Inquire Ed partnership, it is a social studies program, but it's heavily embedded with science and ELA as well. So instead of looking at social studies as its own 30 minute time during the day, all of those things go directly into that ELA time and the science time throughout the day and then really works hard on the portrait of a graduate skills. There's a lot of group work, um, a lot of evidence-based inquiry, things like that that the students are doing in the classroom. So here's some of the things that you will see or maybe have seen throughout this program. So um, we've had a lot of kids Skyping, taking gallery walks, the family posters. Um, they had family members come in and talk about where their family was from um, and some of the traditions and things that they had. Um, they've talked a lot about open-ended versus closed questions. So how do you build inquiry? You ask open-ended questions where you can continue to build and ask more. So they're teaching them how to do that. Um, we have uh, social studies notebooks that the kids are working in, their inquiry notebooks, landforms out of Play-Doh, and these are all direct, tied directly to our state standards in these grade levels. Um, we have kids diving into um, creating their own board games and then the learning that goes into that. Changing the landscape, these are just a few. The founder of Inquire Ed just last week, it's a very small company and she was featured in Forbes magazine as an up and coming entrepreneur for inquiry based education. So that inquiry based education is really where a lot of our schools are heading because it is so deeply rooted in student passion um, and student interest. And then actually on Wednesday, we are hosting an inquiry symposium. We've got six other school districts that are coming to Lakota to see all the things that you just saw in those tweets in our classrooms. So they want to know what we're doing and they want to be right there with the kids seeing what's happening in the classrooms. Um, so that's exciting. The other thing that we're focusing on as far as under the We Are Personalized umbrella is really focusing on the whole child. So last year was the first year that we were full day kindergarten. And so we jumped into that and now we're coming back and we're reflecting on that and learning how we can make that program better. Um, kindergarten, five-year-olds going from two and a half days to that to, I don't know, seven days or seven hours is um, quite a feat. So we have been implementing a PACS model in our schools 
which is really focusing on teaching specific behaviors in students. So how do you sit in a classroom and raise your hand? How do you share information that you want your teacher to hear? Those types of things to really teach them before we come around and say, um, you know, these are the school rules and if you're not following the rules, here's what happens. So it's really driven in teaching them to begin with um, and bringing them to a clear mindset at the beginning of the day in order to make sure that those things happen. PBIS is something that we've been doing for a long time. It's our positive behavior support system, so really encouraging positive behavior. And MTSS, which is really looking at data and being intentional about targeting learning for our students. So a teacher looks at her classroom of 25 students and notices that over the last week, X amount of kids have really struggled to stay on task, so they're gonna teach an intentional PACS lesson around staying on task, or what to do if you're feeling off task. And that really all together encompasses that focus on social emotional learning. Under the We Are Future Ready umbrella, we launched just a couple of months ago our innovation hubs. So our high schools have them, our junior highs have them, our elementaries have them, and finally our early childhoods have them, and they are excited. Um, I personally have a first grader, I have two first graders at one of our schools, and they walked through and they came home and said, Mom, Guess what? I said, what? She said, they turned the media center into an immobation center. <laughs> like, yeah. We'll work on the wording, but they're very excited. And then she said, I hope I can color there. So there's a lot more than coloring, but there is still coloring. Um, the mission of these hubs is to really help kids evolve in their learning experiences through the use of technology. So it's not the kids go into the hubs and they learn how to use the technology. It's the kids are learning in their classroom and creating in their classroom and learning how they can use the things that are in the hub to enhance their presentation or enhance their learning. So if they're studying landforms, this is something that's happening right now, if they're studying landforms in their first grade classroom, they can then go into the hub, put on the VR goggles, and actually go and see some landforms on, in different places within our country and s see them in real life. Um, and then the vision is really to just modernize our instructional practices to really take those practices to the next level and help enhance the lessons, projects, and the problem solving that our students are doing. And here's some pictures from our hubs. Again, they just launched a couple weeks ago, so we're a little bit short on pictures right now, but here's a few. Two of the pictures you'll see up there are our teacher training sessions. Our innovation specialists are tasked with pulling the teachers into the hubs to show them how they can embed this work into their lessons. Um, and then, yeah, so they're going in, they're still checking out books, everything is still the same as far as the media center goes, but it's also now another resource for our teachers to bring their students in and use. Some of you may have seen coming in the Wonder Bus that is new. It's actually going to be, there's going to be sneak previews at the summer fun fairs next week. And then pie night is when we're going to open it up for students to start playing. The purpose of the Wonder Bus is to help extend opportunities that we have in our schools, in our STEAM labs, in our Wonder Labs, and in our innovation centers um, into an element that includes our families. So the idea is, is that families will get on the Wonder Bus with their students and do some exploration. Um, to really support that STEAM um, initiative. This bus will, so there's a picture of it. <laughs> the idea is that we use it for community outreach, so it'll be at things like the Shamrock Shuffle, Earth Day, some of our community events. We're also gonna use it for summer learning. It's gonna travel with the Child Nutrition Bus and the Midpoint Bookmobile to all of our neighborhoods that they service in the summertime so that our students can eat lunch, read, and explore. It'll be at district events, school events. Um, there's a few planned stops at the Midpoint Library, and then we have it available for corporate use also. We had two part... We had two partnerships that helped fund the Wonder Bus. So DCTS, which is the Dayton Cincinnati Technology Solutions, and the Performance Automotive Network, and they're noted on the outside of the bus with, um, as sponsors. So the bus is out there for about two more minutes if anybody wants to go check it out. <laughs> Otherwise, you are welcome to come to the Summer Fun Fair or to Pie Night and see it in person. If you don't make it to those, it'll be at pretty much everywhere after that, so 
don't worry, you won't miss an opportunity. And that's all I have. Yeah, so we have, um, we have about 50 teachers who have signed up to help uh, man the bus for our different events. So we put a list out of event. We have our bank of teachers. We put a list out. We actually put a list out about two weeks ago for our first 15 or so events, and it was filled up within minutes. Um, and they were really excited to see the events for the summer and next year. And I think it's because they really want to be a part of carrying that, that growth and that learning from their classrooms and from their schools to include families. So a lot of times, our, one of our biggest hurdles is getting in some of our families who don't have transportation or maybe don't speak English. Um, and so this is an opportunity that it's coming directly to them in their neighborhood or at an event that they may be at. At events that are necessary, we'll provide translators and things like that so parents can really engage with their children on the bus. And the teachers are really excited to see that happen. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, there was so much in there. I, I just want to go back for a second, though, and I was hoping maybe that you could just, um, I mean, there's so much to celebrate, so I feel bad kind of turning to ask a question. It's okay. like, go for it. Logistics more question, but. Um, so at the beginning, you were talking, you were going over the data, and you were talking about um, the students and being on track, off track, the third grade mm -hmm. reading guarantee, all that fun stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we know that's directly tied to the report card, and I know that there's conversation in the community around how that's tied to Ed Choice and all that different stuff. I want to keep Ed Choice out of it, but I do want to go back and talk about the report card for a second. Could you just help us understand as a board and as a community how on track, off track is determined, like what does that mean? How do, sure. are the kids even identified as being off track and on track? Sure. So the state of Ohio says that by the end of third grade, students have to be marked as on track in the area of reading. And if they're not, then they are retained in third grade for, for a year. Um, we have multiple opportunities throughout the year for students to meet that on track score. So two of the opportunities are the Ohio State tests that the third graders take in the fall and in the spring. And then they take three MAP tests in the fall, the winter, and the spring. And there's a MAP score that determines that can move them to on track. Um, if they don't meet that score then, then they can attend summer school that we provide in the summertime. And they get to take the MAP test again for a fourth time in the summer. Um, and then if they don't meet the score then, then they're retained. However, if they meet the score in the fall of fourth grade, which is their retained third grade year, then they can move on to fourth grade. So if we go all the way back, they start tracking this data in kindergarten. So our kindergartners take the test the very first month that they're in school, and that's considered their first score. So the scores are marked fall to fall. So they take it the fall of kindergarten. Let's say they're marked off track in the fall of kindergarten. They take it again in the fall of first grade with a first grade score that would then move them to on track or off track based on what they score moving into first grade. The state determines our K-3 literacy score based on the number of students who move from off track to on track. So if the beginning of kindergarten, you take that test and you have, in the whole district, say you have 300 kids who are off track, the other 700 kids no longer matter. So not their test score doesn't matter as far as on or off track. So then they look at that small pool of 300 kids, and then they test again in the fall, which is what you see up there, the moving off track to on track. They test again in the fall of those 300 kids. If 150 of them move on track, then that's considered a 50% increase towards the state report card. And then so they track that kindergarten to first grade, first grade to second grade, second grade to third grade, and then they start looking at the retention piece in third grade. So how does that play with students? Because we do have a population in Lakota that's transient, mm -hmm. moving in and out um, based on socioeconomics, whatever that may mm -hmm. be, right? Um, how does that play? So if they are marked off track in another school district, how long do they have to stay here in order to be counted with our scores, like how does all that? Yeah, so that's a tricky piece because if they're coming from a school in Ohio, and they're off track at the school they come from, they're automatically off track here. And so they have, so if they move here in March of whatever grade, then they're considered off track until they move on track. If they move here in say March of third grade and they're moving from an Ohio school, they are still considered up for retention. 
However, if they move from out of state, that's not the case. There's also a, if they are new to the country within three years, they're exempt from retention. So we still mark them off track for state report card purposes, but they cannot be retained in third grade if they've been in the country less than three years. It's the same thing for our special education students. If they have marked on their IEPs that they're exempt from retention because they are significantly low in the area of language arts, then that they're con still considered off track, but they're not up for retention. Can I ask one more question? Are you going to give us Dominate. the I'll, I'll, a chance to I ask? will, okay. absolutely, then yeah. Then you may ask one I'm, more. Maybe. <laughs> um, so we use MAP, mm -hmm. which is the diagnostic mm -hmm. assessment that we use to figure out whether or not they're on track, off track. Does every school district in the state of Ohio use the same assessment? No, they don't. So the only assessment that every single school district uses is the Ohio State test, so or the AIR test. That one is universal. Then they have a list of different assessments that students can take in different, that are district adopted assessments and they've attached a score to whatever that test is. So ours is MAP, some people use STAR, some people use DIBBLES, and there's specific scores that are attached to all of those tests just like we have a score attached to our MAP test. However, when a student comes in from another school district, let's say they use STAR or DIBBLES, we pull that score, we have to look up what that score is to determine whether they were on track or off track. The other thing is, is as soon as a student is deemed off track, we have to provide them a reading improvement plan. So that's another thing that we look for in their files are those improvement plans from their other districts um, or one that was previously created here. And on that plan, we have to outline for every single child that's off track a very specific plan on what we're going to do to work towards moving them on track. So a lot of times it includes a reading specialist or a Title I teacher or extra support in the classroom from the classroom teacher in order to, and then you identify the specific intervention or what you're doing with that child in order to move them forward towards on track. Thank you. You're welcome. I, can I, my turn? Oh, I'm done. <laughs> you sure? Mm -hmm. Thank you, first of all, Christina, for the yeah, presentation. It was great. Um, I just have a question about kindergarten curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, not very specific, but as we get ready for kindergarten registrations, you will notice on the Westchester Liberty Facebook page, which is where I get all of my accurate information, that <laughs> there people are people say, and I know this isn't true, but people say that you know that we don't really do an all-day kindergarten. We do morning and then the afternoon they rest and play. Can you speak a little bit to to that? I mean, I know it's not true, but I'd like the masses to know that are you academically heavy in the morning and you know, that kind of stuff? Or do you pretty much spread it out? Because I also know that you're, we're dealing with a couple of classes of half-day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So how does that equal out the kids that go half-day versus the kids that go all day in the academic and the intervention that they get? Gotcha. So we do have a couple of half-day classes that are operating under the same um, operating standards that our full-day kindergartens are operating under. Um, to say that we only have academics in the morning and play in the afternoon could is com completely unmanageable because no matter what, we're still operating schools that have six and seven hundred kids in them, which means the lunch periods and the special periods have to be built in throughout the day. So it can't be all academics in the morning and then lunch and specials and play in the afternoon. Um, so we really do our best to spread those out. Um, throughout the day so that we have students that are moving to specials and things like that. Our half-day program does not attend specials, so they don't go to um, art, music, gym, our wonder labs, um, and technology. So that part is taken out of their day. Um, however, the instructional minutes that are expected in a half-day program and in a full-day program are the same as far as the number of minutes you must be directly teaching students. However, with the full day program, that offers an opportunity to carry that instruction over into things like what we call play workshop, which is pulling together all of the academics throughout the day. So there's usually a workshop on social studies, a workshop on science or unit, a workshop on language arts, math and writing, and the kids are going in and really doing some exploration during that time. Um, a lot of our full day programs, our classrooms are already utilizing the innovation hubs and spaces like that in order to enhance some of the learning that they're doing in their classroom. Um, did I answer your question? You did. You okay. Did. Um, it, do we notice a the off track, on track, I know it's only our second year of full day kindergarten, do we notice that m 
kids who are in the half day are more off track or the kids that are in the full day or do we not have enough data so that's only our second year to so we looked at it last year going into this year and there really wasn't that much of a difference um, it was really only minuscule a couple of kids yeah so and one more question just okay. out of curiosity do we have innovation specialists in each early childhood or do they share buildings so in our early childhoods and our elementary schools they share okay thank you mm -hmm. One to every two buildings. One to every two. Um, I appreciate the inquire, Ed. How have you, how have the teachers reacted to that? And have you felt that there's a big difference in the reaction to the students and their interest in the curriculum that they're working on with that? Yeah, so the students are very excited. I think anytime you're taking into account things they want to be learning about and building the standards in that way, that's very exciting for them. Um, I think with any new initiative or new program, you have teachers who are ready to fly with it because they really believe in it, and other teachers who need some more growth personally in order to really understand what inquiry-based learning looks like. So this is the first time since I've been in the district that there's been a curriculum that really is transformative in the belief of teaching, right? So it's this program is not scripted in any way. There's no manual. There's no... First you say this to your students, and then you say that, and then you give them this worksheet. It's very open-ended, and so the teachers have to adjust to that as well. So all of our K-2 teachers have dove in and tried at least a few lessons. Some of them are using it start to finish. That's how they're teaching social studies this year. We've spent a lot of time building the standards into the different units that they offer, but the professional development that Inquire Ed provides teachers has nothing to do with their platform and everything to do with how do you teach students with an inquiry-based mindset. So it's really professional development that's good for any teacher, whether you have Inquire Ed or don't. And so that piece has been where some of our teachers have spent some more time learning and understanding and less time imp implementing this year with the hopes that then next year they'll take that learning and dig a little deeper into the implementation. What do you feel like is coming next for our early childhood buildings? What mm. do you hope to accomplish next? That's a great question. Um, I re I, one of the things that we're working on a little bit right now and really is in the beginning stages is really looking deeper into that kindergarten experience. Um, I think that's an area that we could grow in building that experience for our kids and for our families. I think we, we jumped into full day before really thinking about what that looks like from a kid's perspective and making sure that that full day experience was everything that they needed. Um, and it's always tricky with kids coming into kindergarten because we don't know a lot about them. So making sure that they have placements with teachers and peers who are what's best for them as a learner. And so really digging into looking deeper at that and how we start kids in kindergarten um, and really how we progress through that kindergarten experience. Um, I think we also need to start, the Inquire Ed is also coming out with some science units of study soon, so hopefully that'll carry over into um, our early childhoods too in the next couple of years, but that wouldn't be in the immediate future. I think we really need to spend some time sitting back and soaking in all of the things you just heard about. I think we need to go deeper instead of broader, and so I, for the next year I think we're really going to spend some time learning how to incorporate the innovation hubs and the materials that are there and really learning deeper about that inquiry-based learning. Thank you. I think between the two of you, you and Brad did a nice job of peeling back the layers of onion and understanding the literacy score on the report card. It's not what it appears to be, so mm -hmm. thank you for that explanation. Yeah, you're welcome. And you did ask lots of questions, but they were good questions. <laughs> um, I also really value seeing phonics included. I think that often that's a missing link for our early readers, so mm -hmm. that's nice to see that being incorporated back into it. Yeah. Could we get a copy of this presentation? Sure. Please? Yep. And my final piece is to say I, the Wonder Bus is a wonderful enrichment opportunity, and I hope that we're really using it, especially with those students that we see as the most vulnerable, as we mm -hmm. talked about before. Thank you. So thank you for your work on that. Sure, no problem. Don't yeah, and, I, and oh. No, keep going. No, I was just going to say, just to piggyback on what we, there are so many great things happening at the early childhood schools, uh -huh. and I, um, as an end user, you know, 
know, my daughter's in kindergarten, you can see those things taking hold. And just from the perspective of having been in the early childhood to now seeing her experience it, um, Makerspace, the Innovation Hub, all that different stuff that she's experiencing is just, um, it's, it's just, it's really cool to watch her go through that. Um, when we talk about the on-track, off-track, my questions were a little bit intentional um, because I want people to understand that, um, to Linda's point earlier, that when you peel the layers back, it's, just, it's not as easy as just looking at a state report card and saying, this is a good school, this is a bad school. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're talking about every school can choose which assessment to give, and the state's somewhat giving an arbitrary number based on whether or not that's it gets very confusing, so I appreciate your effort and really kind of going through that and talking about it. And I think that every one of us in the community, we do have expectations our kids are reading. And we have to look at the data and we have to respond to the data, but we can't just use that report card as a snapshot to say whether or not we're being successful or not. Mm -hmm. We have to have those intentional conversations and dig deeper on it. Right. And that you're only being assessed by those that are off track initially. Mm -hmm. Right. That was the eye opening piece for me that is, is that that score is determined around such a small pocket of kids and all of our kids who are on track. There's no reflection of that right. in the K3 literacy score. Maybe it should be something we address in the quality profile. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think that's all I have. Thank you, Thank Mrs. You. French. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you for all that. Thank you for all of your work on the Wonder Bus. That does not happen without no you problem. for the months and months you've been doing that. So thank you. My husband was teasing me last night. He was like, I feel like you're like birthing another baby tomorrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. I, I don't know what to say to that, but yeah. <laughs> the Wonder Bus baby. Yeah. yeah. But thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. We're ready to move on to the next topic. Gentlemen, come on up. Just a quick press of the button and it'll turn green. There you go. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the uh, educational vision component of the master plan. Tracy's been involved um, with that through small groups and um, larger groups to talk about how we think education should look going forward and how that will impact our facilities moving forward. So um, the bulk of the presentation tonight will be about that piece and I'll give a little bit of update about our meeting for the OFCC and the enrollment study that we've done after uh, Tracy's done. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, is this okay? Um, it seems like I always follow like an early childhood presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I get that. The pretty colors, a nice font. <laughs> you're going to get a clinical look at this. And um, I was going to give our compliment on the presentation. It was very nice and um, soothing. And and I think you know it's it's but it's always nice to see that there's a bridge to um, what we're trying to accomplish on a facility side to alternative ways that kids are getting education. When you can take a school bus out instead of build bricks and mortar, that's just another opportunity of learning. And so we can see that, again, facilities planning and how we teach children, it has something to do with facilities, but very little to do with facilities sometimes. So I think that part of what we're going to talk about today and what we've been talking about in small group is really about this. Um, so let me tell you, I'm going to take you through kind of a process and some of the results of the process that we're, we are so far, and then where we're <coughs> going to go from there. Um, we've been intentionally working in small groups, um, smaller focus groups that um, are intentionally directed at specific groups that have sometimes a lot different perspectives when it comes to how, how they see education or, or the environments that they're in. Um, we started with um, half day, basically half day sessions. Um, we started in this order and for good reason this order, students, teachers, and teachers and staff, and then parents, and then community and township members, and even business owners. Um, it's intentional that way because, you know, probably the first and, and what I enjoy teaching to as a former teacher is that student group who's frankly very honest with you. They don't hold a lot back, and even things they wrote on the flip charts, I think, um, well, I think I remember Betsy reading one going, oh my gosh, that's a pretty bold statement on that. And they were right, and it, it talked about really experiencing their day and the environment they're in and, and what they're trying to experience. And so when you see that 
when you see that young students are getting the experiences they're getting in these hubs, innovation centers, even the STEAM labs, those kind of things at a young age, and as they progress, those opportunities, even though the class opportunities are greater, sometimes those environment opportunities are less because they're not getting, they don't get a chance to be in a collaborative area because they have six periods of credit they have to meet to make a state requirement. They have to, and so those experiences of collaboration and, and exploratory get lost. And sometimes it's because those spaces get so separated. And I think the students really made light of that for us. Um, and so what we tried to do in that first group, uh, that first work session we did was we, we first tried to define that facilities master plan. And what I tried to make clear to everybody in every group and everybody I always talk to when I'm going through this is that the first question I asked all the groups when they came in is, what do you think you're doing here? And a lot of them are like, well, we're going to go after a bond program. And I'm like, well, that's not why I'm here. I mean, I, I have nothing to do with a bond program. I, I don't do bond work. I don't do any of that stuff. I do facilities master planning and educational development. Um, and so we made it very clear about the purposes of facilities master plan and that facilities master planning is really about setting a, a roadmap for investment into facilities, whatever that roadmap may be, facilities or not, that every district should have a facilities master plan. How it gets funded is kind of that step I don't know, 526 of 700, when you have to go through this and decide where your priorities are. And so I felt it important to walk through what facilities planning is really about, about exploring, you know, obviously the educational framework and your curriculum and where you're going to go in that direction, your demographics, your condition, and then certainly your funding mechanisms when those come to light. But to step back to say, good facility planning should be an everyday practice. It shouldn't be about I mean, most do end up needing some sort of funding mechanism. Some districts have some fortune of having some reserve funds, some have to go after bonds, some renew bonds. There's all kinds of different ways. But I wanted to step away from that because that's not our purpose here. And so, I, and I think visioning is about that. The other thing we talked about was local and global demographics, and I think you're going to see that some of the challenges that, that everybody sees go across that idea of where demographics are going to on a local level and a global level. Um, we broke down the process of learning really trying to just bare bones it. You know, what do we, how do we learn and what are we learning to? And, um, and breaking down that model of the industrial education. Um, we spent quite a bit of time talking about mastery of objectives and not, not just trying to set objectives and then we have 185 days to meet those objectives and if we don't, okay, we're gonna take summer off and just come back to the next 185 instead of truly mastering and trying to really think about how time comes into play instead of, instead of just the objective. So can we spend better time in education, students mastering the objectives they're given before they move on to the next level? And although that doesn't seem facilities related, it's very much facilities related. When your early childhood is trying to achieve these goals, and and Ms. O'Connor, I'm, I'm with you, phonics should always be there. I mean, I've always believed as an educator, my gosh, Thank goodness we're coming back to it. But even in that, in that avenue of trying to connect the reading to the writing and incorporating that, we need different ways that we can group students together, where they can find resources, how they can find them. Are they going to be sitting in front of a teacher teaching them, or are they going to do peer learning, are they going to do large group, small group, individual? All those come into play. And guess what? That's a facility's impact on how those spaces are defined. As you walk some of you through your elementary schools, look, there's a lot of great things happening. But there's some hallways you're walking through and there's kids working in the hallway and there's coats hanging out there and there's all the storage materials out in the hallways because you simply don't have the space for it. And so we need to explore why that process of learning and the industrial model of education really have to be flipped and how facilities can help impact that. And then finally, the, that first one, we really talk about the role of the teacher and I think that Again, trying to identify what um, some of the things we're trying to include into our discussion is really that, you know, what does that mean? Um, and it has so many different meanings as you look forward um, in your education. So our goals basically we're going through this is that we really wanted to create the educational vision that guides the facilities master plan. Deconstructing all these, balancing all these, defining that role of student and teacher and then Finally, and we didn't get to this in the first work session, we got to it in the second one, is really applying your strategic plan to facilities planning. I've always said this, is that if you don't 
If you're not completing that circle of why you completed a strategic plan, then don't do a strategic plan. If it's there to just check a box, then save your time and money. Because when you're trying to go back to it, and again, go back to that early childhood discussion, everything was about the strategic plan. Uh, Ms. French linked everything back to your goals and your strategic plan. That's how your facilities plan should be. When you look at those goals you see in, your, in, the, in the facilities section or your environmental section of your strategic plan, this has to link to it because then that completes a circle of the goals you're, you're trying to meet. And eventually those goals and all those hard to see still at this level, those facility goals are going to go back to those educational goals and go back to your um, future ready goals and your personalization goals. They all tie together. So you start to see that, and, it's, and, and I will tell you, I think this is very difficult from somebody who just drops into the conversation occasionally to see how the school district's doing. And, and, but I get it because everybody's so just super busy anymore. But if we can, and I think part of the challenge is just you're going to see that, that we're come up with is really trying to continue to educate the community about all these pieces together. Um, you, this community is so involved in so many things that you do. And, and it's amazing to see the participation that continues to happen. Um, like in our second work session, we had almost every one of our participants show up. We were set up for like 50 of the four groups, and we had to set more tables and chairs because everybody from the first work session decided to show up the second time, which is kind of a nice thing to see. Um, and so they're engaged. They're, they're committed to this. Um, so as we went through some of the, ses the session one exercise, I just wanted to show you, whoops, I, I didn't mean to put that first one in the role of the teacher. Um, the first one was really, I'm sorry, that's, that's bad, but um, is really about the challenges that you're going to see. Um, and I'm going to, what this does, these are called wordles. And what I do is I just take everything that was written down by all the students, all the teachers, all the community members. And when you put those in, it raises kind of the top 50 terms. And the bigger terms are, you know, kind of are the ones that are most driven. And so you see things like, you know, the challenges that, that they see are things like mental health and, you know, how to, how to deal with diversity. And not that diversity is a bad thing. And again, sometimes you have to put these things in context. But how do we handle a district that's grown and all of a sudden we don't look like we did 5, 10, or 15 years ago? And what does that mean to facilities? So if we have increases of first-time English learners, what does that mean to our facilities when 10 years ago that population was a small percentage and now that continues to increase? What's, what's the space implications? What's the resource and staffing allocations? What's the transportation? All those things come into play. Um, was I, when I break this down a little more to know what gr each group said, I'm going to tell you that the, f the students pointed out their top two things, which was fascinating to me, and especially the junior high students, were really impressive. The high school kids are just bright as anything, but your middle school kids aren't afraid to speak up. And I had one middle school table, had all middle school, they were talking about the education system in Sweden. And so I had to go do some Googling about education in Sweden <laughs> to make sure I was catching up with them a little bit. But when they were, when they were talking about how poverty is going to have a big impact on their educational experience, and poverty meaning that, that your students recognize that they come from a district that has means. You know, we, we struggle with budgets. Everybody does. There's not a district that doesn't struggle with that. But they understand that they're better off than most. And they recognize that. But they understand also that the food bank has empty shelves at Christmas. They understand that there's coat drives and food drives going on in your schools that make a difference every day. And so as that and as there's gaps that get created, they want to try to figure out, well, how do our environments support students who aren't coming from what we come from every night? And that's a pretty important thing. And so you start to explore how you can better incorporate all of those kind of social type services that help that inequality that brings economic gaps together. You know, things like food stores and, you know, um, clothing stores that are not right in front of your face that students are comfortable to walk into. And sometimes it takes a while to get there. But how do you do that? How do you make it? Mental health, that was big with every group. Understanding that the link to mental health, to, to safety and all of that is important. So how do you create space that does that? Um, I think that the other thing that the, the students looked at were two things. They thought that the teacher was a concern in the, in the, in the fact that they understand that teachers are harder to attract into education today. 
they see it. They see what teachers go through every day and they, they know how hard they work. And there, there's a keen recognition that how are you going to attract the brightest and the best? What are you doing to make sure that when you walk into the job fair, that your district is the one that they want to come to? Now, there's all kinds of things you can do. But again, how do facilities impact the environments that, student, that teachers walk into? You know, is that the workspace that they want to be in? And can you attract them that way? And so I think that um, those challenges were there, and you can see that. The second one was the role of the teacher, and there's all kinds of different terms out there, communicator, facilitator. You know, one thing that we only saw on one chart, I thought this was fascinating, was content area expert. It only came out in actually the, the business owners and the, and the government officials actually thought that that was one of the key components to a future teacher. And as we got more, and we actually explored that a little more, because honestly, you don't hear that very much anymore. You feel like there's so much information from different sources out there, which goes to some of the things that we see um, in moving forward, that that content expert may not be the most important trait they have. What you see up here is a lot of actually soft skills. Mm -hmm. And so the question that I would ask each group was, so if you had to go back and you had to create the curriculum in the colleges, the education colleges and universities around this country, what would you do? How would you help teachers prepare for what they're going into? And I'm telling you, a lot of these soft skills came up. But as we got into that content expert, you know, when, when the business owners out there and the government and, and, and those community members, they want to make sure that, that your educators are content experts. They do. They want to make sure that if there's more in-depth, going into the depth instead of the, into, instead of the width, that there is somebody in that classroom that is competent in what they're teaching. And then, of course, how they teach. And so I thought it was important to bring that up because a lot of people don't say that anymore. And I think it's becoming more and more important that we are. And finally, that the last question we ask is in Lakota schools, teachers and students will, and I have them complete this sentence. Um, and I think looking forward that, you know, this idea of, of the words that come up are collaboration and unity and, and shared vision come up all the time. And this relationship that the, that the school will have to your community and to the people those buildings serve is going to be more and more important. And so when I walk into your, when I walk into your school as a community member, a parent, a grandparent, a first time visitor, <coughs> what are your schools saying to invite that? And I'm going to tell you, that's going to get tougher as now that you have double entries into schools because that's the safe procedure. But I'm going to tell you, it feels very clinical. It doesn't, but it needs to happen. And so how do we create environments that both protect our students, teachers, staff, and community members in there, but still really promote this idea of being a part of the, what the community it, it serves? And so um, are there ways to do that? You know, recreation centers or senior centers or, um, and a lot of things that we talked about in here were, you know, that the use of the schools and really the non-use of school buildings through the year becomes more and more of a concern. Um, but how do we do that better? How do we show to the community that, you know, this is truly a community school, that, you know, tax dollars, regardless of, of where the tax dollars are going, that everybody feels like they're paying taxes for living in a community they want to live in. And so whether that rec center, and, and much like the Mason was the model 20, almost 25 years ago now, wasn't it? I mean, when that became one of the first models in Ohio that that says, you know what, our communities belong in our schools, and we're going to prove it. And so they put a recreation pool and a lazy river and a senior center and a community theater and a bank. And, and all of a sudden, people said, that makes a lot of sense for that to happen. How do we make, that, make sure that this will happen? I, let out, I, I gave a stat the other, to each group that, I, that everybody found fascinating is that, because everybody says that their schools are used all the time. And I would contend they're not. I would say that 70% of your buildings are dedicated to classrooms, because that's pretty close to every school district in the country. And I would contend that on a 365 day a year, 24 hour day, that your classrooms are used less than 15%. And that's the truth. Your gyms are used, your auditoriums are used, your fields are used. But you go to, like walk into your high schools, you have one side that is truly community, big space, high bay, hands on, the other side, classrooms. And see how many people at 4 o'clock are using those classrooms. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we do that better? How do we do it better to make sure that we ensure that 
the investment that you are making into buildings is an investment that the whole community can really embrace. Mm -hmm. And I think that became a big, a big part of what we started to talk about. And so um, we put all that together and we tried to synthesize all that into the second work session where we put all the groups together. And um, which, of course, when they walked in, you know, teacher sat with teachers and some parents, and, and then the student sat with their parent. So I mixed that up pretty quickly. I made them kind of meet a new neighbor. I, I, I wanted to make sure that they were, um, they were just a little bit uncomfortable with a group that they were, because I, I mean, sometimes a student talks different when their parents sit at the table about what they truly feel about what's going on in the experience. Or the teachers have been at the same school all year, so let's get them mixed up, so we mixed them up. So we really talked about the district strategic plan, and we really, we opened up with that to make sure that we understood what it meant. And the first exercise we actually did was asking people what it was. And one group, know, two groups got all four points, but I think they had a little help because of the people who worked on the strategic plan. But it really trying to, you know, it, it's hard to get everybody on board because, but I wanted everybody to understand that that's important. And so we really went through an exercise, which then we, we hit really two pieces pretty hard defining that personalized learning plan and how do you do current facilities and how they meet the future needs. And then we did a, a couple exercises to support that. Um, so in the, personalized in, the, in the personalized learning, what I asked the group was like, was okay, what does personalized meaning mean to you? As I sat with the district personnel in my first meeting at, overall, um, I really pressed on that. I mean, I, I pressed it pretty hard because I'm gonna be honest with you, Everybody says they want to do personalized learning. The percentage of people who actually can implement good personalized learning is very small. And the reason is, it's very time consuming. It takes time. It's not an overnight process. Frankly, it's not an over the year process. It is a year building, years building block process that gets you to what personalized really means. And so trying to get to where you're going here, and you saw it again in your early childhood, these early implementation things that you're doing, those student choices, so inquiry-based learning, that's student choice. And so everybody thinks about these things at that middle and high school level, but they do occur at the elementary and that early childhood level. You see it in inquiry-based learning. That's a student choice that they're trying to make. The opportunities and increased opportunities and what that means. And I think when, they were, when these groups were talking about those increased opportunities, they were talking about within the buildings. They were talking about that it is difficult at your high schools to mix hands-on, problem-based, or project-based learning to core curriculum because the spaces are just simply separated. Your teachers do a great job of it, and, and your staff does a great job of it, but the physical environment makes it difficult to integrate the two together when it's a very important part of what we do today. When we're trying to teach, when you, you, know, you want to implement a STEAM a comprehensive STEAM program and you don't have science labs in your elementary schools, then are you really teaching to that lab-based curriculum when you get to your secondary grades? It's like, it's like trying to put together a varsity basketball program but only letting them start in the ninth grade. Nobody would do that in athletics, certainly. God forbid we would not have a third grade travel basketball team. <laughs> Why don't we have this in our environments? And those are the things that people were really looking at when they talked about personalized learning, is getting those spaces that really get to those, those things. The flexibility of space and schedule and time. Um, one of the things we talked, again, another thing we talked about was, again, I asked this question everywhere I go, is that your projected enrollment for high schools, I don't know, 4,500 or so? I asked every group if they really felt that you needed 4,500 seats in 10 years for high school students, and not one group said yes. Now, they're going to come to you with a facilities master plan. And what will it tell you if they have on there not enough seats for your projected enrollment for high school? How will you react to that? How will the administration act to that, the school board act, your community react to that? Because nobody believes you need that many seats, but the minute you deliver a facilities master plan that doesn't have enough boxes out there and enough chairs in there, that's where you start to th talk about your schedule and your time, is how time helps to find capacity. So once again, a facilities plan is not, none of those are bricks and mortar. Schedule and time add no bricks and mortar, but can increase capacity beyond any measure that you have. So you're exploring things like opportunities for year-round education. 
Are you exploring opportunities for 12 hours high school and 12 hour high school days? Are, you, are, you, are there more opportunities to, to connect into Butler Tech and how those work better? When students, again, this is, I think, one of the most difficult things to do is pull a high school kid off of their campus for a couple hours because, oh my gosh, all my friends will be doing something else without me. And so how do we make it so that's such an integral part? Butler Tech offers, and you're so connected to them. You're, you're a board member. How do we connect that better with all the opportunities of that awesome building that's three miles down the road? and making sure that happens better. Those are no extra bricks and mortar for you that increase your capacity overnight. But you have to take the steps to get there, and people recognize that. Now, that's not to say, and I'm, I, I, we gotta caution this, that's not to say that, that there aren't opportunities of traditional learning environments still. There are students who thrive in lecture and discussion, and there should be opportunity for that. But there should be, equal opportunity to those other avenues and the spaces that are, are going to do that. Real world experiences and then obviously that subject mastery and how you get there. Um, this comes up more and more is your student teacher ratios and your class sizes. Um, this was on a challenge. This is across the board challenge. Um, how you're going to meet future facility needs um, and how do we avoid that. And again, sometimes there's no way to avoid having the 30 or 32 in a classroom because of the way the schedule works or the, the cohort that's coming through. But I feel like at some point, there are groups that felt like that was the norm. And maybe it is and maybe it isn't. And, but if that is a perception, look, perception's reality. And so how do we make it? And, I will, and so sometimes it's about the building and the, and the layout of the building. I've seen more buildings that have the exact same capacity but because of narrower hallways and the way the rooms are set up, that they feel so much smaller because they don't have any collaboration areas or the media center that connects or a cafeteria that can support. They have the same capacity, but one building feels like it can always hold more and it never feels crowded and you'll never hear a complaint. Um, and so those matter. Um, the focus on the whole child, that was the last thing on the early childhood. Um, and so again, it's those space types that get you there. Those hubs are an incredible benefit. And you feel the excitement. And um, you know, fascinating, Mr. Lovell, while you talk about your, as your kindergartners are experiencing it, that, so you didn't experience that, and you might not have felt like you missed something until you watch that. Mm -hmm. Then I feel like, boy, I missed something. Um, and so anytime we can offer, offer, offer up that opportunity. Um, can I just hit yeah. on something really quick, a couple things. Um, I just want to make sure that we're clear, though. When we talk about student ratios, I just think it's really important to note that it's not necessarily facilities. I mean, it is. Obviously, if you have smaller class sizes, you need more spaces. Mm -hmm. It's really an operating dollar thing, yeah. and that's, um, you know, the more money we have, mm -hmm. the lower the class sizes go, the more teachers we can hire. The other thing also I want to say, too, is I love your point, though, and I just wanted to make sure we touch on this. When we start talking about spaces and space use, I think that that is a huge challenge across our district. We have very different buildings. We have buildings that were built in the 70s with different specs for classroom size mm -hmm. versus buildings built in the late 90s and the class size and how those spaces are used. So as we talk facilities plan, one of the things that we keep talking on the committee is equity as well across the district. Mm -hmm. You know, some spaces in our, in, at these buildings are way easier to transform right, as we talk about um, creating innovative learning spaces and being able to work with our students, and other buildings don't have that flexibility. Right. right. So well, I just and thought that was and, important. And I think to that point is where, where those ratios are obviously budget-driven, because they, they are. When you go through tough times, look, it's your, what's your biggest expense? People. Mm -hmm. It's people. That's right. Always going to be. And so, so I worked with school district a long time ago, not too far from here, that passed a class size initiative. And so when they had the opportunity to reprogram their buildings, they constructed extended learning areas. It was one of the first, one of the first opportunities to extend the learning areas to schools. And what they ended up doing was not that the class per teacher declined, but because they had extended learning areas that were connected to the classroom, they were able to share that space, which reduced the number of students and they could use aides and resource staff to help with that class size. And so there's where space comes into play. When I can create a space that I can observe, but lessen, the, lessen that there's 30 kids in my classroom because seven can go in that room, but I can observe them and they're doing good work and it's got the technology and the tools and the resources in there, 
that's how you get there with the same amount of money. And so there's, you're exactly right. It, it's mostly linked to, to budget, not your spaces. Until your spaces can add, can add that kind of idea of sure. something that feels less. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yep. Um, so the next one actually talks about, um, because the question was, do your facilities really meet those goals? And look, I think there was actually a lot of yeses out there. Uh, technology kept coming up as a very positive for your district. You guys are, you have a, there's a very good reputation of your technology. Um, and I, I mean, I think the kids probably have a, a different perspective on it. They're, you know, they're so far ahead of all of us anyway. Um, but they also understand that, boy, you guys are giving them real opportunities that they see other school districts not getting. And so, and again, as you get these hubs, up and going as you get this, you know, the more personalized. Um, but I also think um, one of the things in the facilities goals that came up in the, in the staffing and teachers, because we had talked about it and I introduced this idea of, of really having a space that's committed to student improvement. That, you know, it's to be able to link all this together. That last presentation, once again, just told you the nightmare of logistics of just trying to get data and the right type of data. Now, when you're talking about schools that don't connect very well because of the transitions, just buildings, and I'm trying to get second graders connected to third graders and that progress to happen, I think one of the things that the teacher saw that could be beneficial is just a space that's committed to student improvement, like that we can track our students, meet as teams, that really, in, that we can individualize each, per, each student. And how do we get that space that we can use together instead of, well, we can meet in the hub when there's nobody in there, or we can meet in my classroom because they're at specials. And is there a space that's kind of committed to it where if I want to put up the data for our team of, of students, I can put it up on the wall and not have any fear of, you know, confidentiality matters or anything like that. They really felt like that's a necessary space to get to the goals that you want to get to. But you know what, that's going to impact your capacity. It's going to impact your space. It's going to impact that. So how do you do it? Not just with technology, because the technology is great, but technology is right there in front of you, and when it disappears, it's hard to get back. And so trying to flip, that's why I still use flip charts in meetings, because I can see the story. And I think there's, there's some, some value to that. And so in, in, in cases where you are meeting this, these, you know, in the high school, there are multi-grade classrooms. There are things like, you know, the resource staffing spaces, they recognize that they're there. I even saw a positive on um, how your high schools are, are adapting some space to make sure they're dealing with the mental health of students. And so there's real positive stuff that's happening out there. Things, again, that they're seeing that where they don't meet. Again, the high class sizes. But again, some budget restrictions there. Um, you know, limited flexible space in old buildings. And not that old buildings are bad buildings. You know, let's never make that mistake. Um, and then, but number of transitions, grade configurations came up a lot. Um, equitable facilities. That was a big issue. Is one side of the district compared to the other side of the district? And, you know, where growth happens and where we're stagnant, but where the old facilities are located versus the new facilities. Mm -hmm. And that has to be paid attention to. Yeah. And, but also understanding that equitable doesn't mean one-to-one. -one. That is very important to understand. Equitable is being able to deliver the resources that each community needs. And that's what they mean. And so when I have, and, but I'm going to tell you, the perception once again is that when you're on the east side and the west side and you see your ninth grade centers, that is a perception that's out there. Now, they're both great schools, great leadership, great teachers. But a building and looking at a building can have, can reflect on a perception that is sometimes negative, not, not that it should. As I walk through, I'll go to it. I, if I, as I go through West, I'm telling you, although that building's old and it's, you know, likely hard to renovate, it's got spaces you'll never see again. That media center is huge. Mm -hmm. That those classrooms, I'm walking into classrooms that are regular classrooms that are 1,200 square feet. Any teacher would die for a 1,200 square foot room instead of six or 700. And so be careful when you're going through a plan not to judge based on just a, an appearance of something and making sure, again, how we're educating the community out there that these are the types of things that work in buildings. I can walk into West and find great spaces. The condition and how we renovate a space like that's the challenge and how we get there. Um, and then finally, those, um, those industrial floor plans, double loaded corridors, narrow hallways, lack of storage that offer those kind of things out there. Um, the next exercise then was about 
I asked to um, talk about future spaces and where elementary, middle, and high, and where we can see some overlap of spaces. Um, you know, the elementary is fun. It's, um, you know, children's museum style, hands-on, very colorful. Um, there's talk about how do we get, how do we make our special spaces more integrated into what we want to do and how those work. Um, I sometimes see that those special spaces get compromised because of the extended programs that we have to do and, the, and what we have to deliver. Um, and so, and sometimes due to budget, we push in s some specials into the classroom which may need their own space. Not that that's a bad thing because I think integration's good too. Um, but everybody loves that you see hubs is on all of them. Everybody loves the idea and the way they're going to go. Soft spaces could go across this too. Um, soft spaces are those kind of informal educational spaces that students gather together. Collaboration is always going to be mentioned in these. At the, at the middle grades level, advisory and explore, exploratory spaces, you know, this is, you know, again, this is near and dear to my heart as an old middle grades educator. This idea that our kids need to see where their future can be and explore a lot of different pathways, um, it's hard. I mean, it's already a hard age. But then you're going to walk into a high school that has 2,000 kids in it and I've got all these curriculum choices and I've got all these and without some sort of exposure in the types of spaces that they're going to walk into, that's hard for a student in their transition. Um, Student-led spaces I thought was really interesting. Um, I thought this one came up only on the middle grades one. But the student-led spaces are really those spaces that students are creating on their own. And whether they're just those, you know, outdoor, those ELAs, that, you know, those extended learning spaces or, you know, huddle rooms that we can create. Um, you know, the maker spaces, those types of things, let them lead those. Um, the high school, more flexibility, you know, this idea that, and I think more flexibility as I read into it and I heard the conversations, were really about schedule and time. Time is a big issue. Students don't feel like they have enough. Teachers certainly don't. Administrators, I don't know how administrators are managing it all some days. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, trying to figure out, I mean, you know, is, is it the homework? Is it the extracurricular activities? It's, what is it? And so if we can offer some flexibility, again, sometimes it's in time, um, sometimes it's in the space, um, sometimes it's in the schedule or your offerings. Um, but when a student might have an opportunity to, to go to class a couple hours in the morning and then go do a middle day something and then come back and if they want to come back at three or four o'clock to take the rest of their courses, you know, there's some real opportunities for those kind of things. Now, the domino of that is that you've got, you know, teacher contract issues and you've got staffing issues and custodial issues and maintenance issues. But I'm going to, or athletic issues or transportation issues. But I'm going to tell you, there's always going to be an excuse. But people are solving those. And so we're just trying to explore. Again, I'm looking for those non-bricks and mortar opportunities that aren't going to cost you really big money to start. There's some operating dollars that get associated with it, but how can we do it without bricks and mortar? And um, that cost, I mean, over time costs more. Um, student office spaces, I thought was a really cool idea. Where do students go to just kind of do some individual stuff? And this can be soft space if it needs to be. Cafeteria options. Cafeteria options, I think, across the board have to be discussed. Um, I think most, most administrators are sick and tired of the lunch period dictating their schedules. And I'm going to tell you, I bet 80% of administrators have to deal with that. And when the lunch day determines how you set up your day, we've got it backwards. <laughs> and so how do we do it better? Um, and so, and what does the cafeteria mean anymore? Well, I don't know. Um, but you figured out a different use of your libraries. I bet if you went and dug hard, you could probably figure out alternative ways to feed kids. So the lunch isn't dictating when kids have to do what. Um, and then also that, um, that, that community space and connections, and that connections piece was, was important. The idea of your partnerships moving into your school buildings, business partnerships, community partnerships, of being involved and visible day to day is going to become more and more important from all kinds of perspectives, from career opportunities to budget items to sharing cost, all those things come into play. And as, we, as we're able to do that, those kind of connections are going to be important. What, what are the spaces they're coming into? Where they're not feeling like they're taking over somebody's space, but they really feel like it's theirs when they walk in. And then finally, career explorations. And again, I go back to, okay, how do we tie in the best way to 
what, what I believe is one of the best resources in the, in the state of Ohio in Butler Tech. And, and I don't exaggerate when I say that. Um, how do I connect that better in with what we're doing? Um, you see it in your, in, your junior, in your junior high spaces where we've got those labs and they're awesome labs. Um, but how do we get that more integrated into the core curriculum? I think those were important to the, to the community also. And finally, the last exercise we do is, and, and I think it's a fun exercise, I call it three, two, one, two, three, um, where I just ask some really quick questions. You know, three things that make Lakota great. And I just listed kind of the top four or five that came up on the list. Um, overwhelmingly, teachers and staff is what makes you guys great. Overwhelmingly. Almost every, almost every sheet had it. Every individual filled it out. Almost every individual had that on there. Um, but I think the technology, again, very high praise for your technology in the district. Um, your, vi your vision and willingness change. I saw more comments, and it wasn't a lot of comments, but about how, and again, not, I, this isn't to, to cast any judgment on past administrations, but how the current administration and leadership are really stepping forward, are really taking some risks in change, and that's hard. And I saw, I bet I saw six comments on that, which is unusual. From, from community members like that. Um, the diversity and those opportunities that are, that are created because of that. Um, the challenges that they want to overcome. Class sizes and student-teacher student ratios. How do we do that with facilities? Again, I was asking them to link this back to facilities. Mental health, poverty, uh, future teacher demands as you're going to compete more and more for a market share that's simply not going to be there. Um, and then educational inflexibility was a huge challenge. And that links directly to things that stand in your way. Um, I asked them one obstacle that stands your way. Money and funding was a big one. And everybody recognizes you have limited funds to do things. And so how do you best use that? The community support. I've heard across the board how there are different factions in this community that don't see eye to eye when it comes to all this. Now, you're never going to get it all together. Nobody agrees with a final master plan. I mean, that consensus is a myth, frankly. But it's trying to prioritize within the needs that you recognize what makes your facility plan better. And so are there things that you're going to be able to do in your facilities master plan that everybody's going to agree on? Yes. Are there some hills that you just can't take? Yes. Are there things that you're never going to agree on? Yes. So let's just get that out of the way. But at some point, when you're going back to this educational vision and those space types and the, and the goal to where you want to be to that is in your strategic plan, you're trying to get through these. Because past habits and culture, we talked about it. Don't, you know, this idea that it worked for me, it's going to work for my kids. Nobody believes that. Nobody in education believes that. And so, because it, it's different. And what they're working towards is different. Nobody likes the idea of state and federal mandates. But it's a reality we live under. And until we can get state legislators and state departments of education to understand that there is, there is hands-on, career-based exploration that can count towards core curriculum, we're never going to get there. And we've got to get there. Um, and then future teacher shortages was, a, was something that came as an obstacle out there. Um, characteristics that support your goals. Um, these are facility characteristics, flexible spaces, collaboration, adaptable. Now, flexible and adaptable are different. They're very different. You know, flexible is stuff that, you know, you might be able to, you know, move day to day. Adaptable is that next year it's something different. That we're, this is a whole new course and this space works for that. That's an adaptable space. Being open to change, getting parent and community inclusion. You already have big participation, but what I did hear from the parent group that night, and it was more than one person that said it, is that I seem to see the same people that contribute, that, that participate. You guys don't have the patent on that. That's a lot of everybody's that. You, you run into the same people that do that. And so what they're worried about, they're worried about is fatigue, about being able to sustain the momentum with the same people working. And then certainly partnerships and how those partnerships work. And then finally, facility strategies to achieve your goals. Great configuration and transition has to be looked at. Um, I think this was across the board. Um, so many transitions in there and how do we, I just don't feel like anybody buys into that. Um, and again, there's reasons you've done it. And so we're not casting judgment on past decision making, but we're trying to move forward in this. Um, more emphasis on student-centered spaces, um, capacity defined by space and time, um, and then education um, to community about facilities. And again, that education is, 
as often as you can get out there about facilities and what it means to your educational mission, that's the most important. Making sure that, ed that facilities are about education. That's how this gets communicated. And then creating those spaces of collaboration and how that works. And so then, so our next steps, we're going to have a community meeting. We're going to basically kind of go over the, this same presentation. We'll shorten up the, I'll shorten up some of the language. Um, but we have a couple things we're going to go over in that meeting. That's going to be at Lakota West, freshman at 6 p.m. Um, and then I'm going, to be fin I'm going to be finalizing the visioning document with what we hear from the thought exchange that comes out of that. Um, and then we start to apply this visioning to the facility master planning process. So how do we link the strategic planning goals that your facility goals in there, but also when you're developing those options. So we should be able to link the strategic plan to your vision to your options. So when, when Jim's going through this, Jim and Earl are going through this, this is their checklist. Did we meet some of these challenges? Did we overcome some of these challenges? Did we, did we find non-facility solutions to what we were doing? So all of these have to be kind of a checklist. And then, then comes your prioritization. Again, that's the most important part of facility planning. Um, your facilities plan is going to show all your need, but that's not your implementation plan. We've got to always have that right. That's not your implementation plan. Good facility plan has good prioritization in it, um, which can be driven by your strategic plan and your vision. And then finally, it'll drive those recommendations. Um, obviously, continuous board updates um, that we'll, you know, we're going to keep you in the loop as much as we can, as, as much as you need us to. And so hopefully, we can keep that communication between us happening. That's it. Comments? I have one, but I can wait. I can be patient. Do you like um, so on the second slide, I just happened to notice that you had up there um, a video that I'm assuming that you showed. It was the video, This Will Revolutionize Education. Yeah. The one with the slide? Yeah. So um, just a, the bottom one in there in the middle, that, that's such a phenomenal video. I think that if the board hasn't seen it, you should YouTube and watch it. it the heart of the video basically talks about how over the course of the decades or century, right, like all these things were going to revolutionize education, whether it was the TV or whatever it may be, right? And um, the idea behind it is that it's not a revolution, it's an evolution, right? Education, anything's really an evolution, right? It just continues to adapt and to build. My question is, is that, um, you know, we can all think about the schools and the facilities that were built in the 70s without walls, right? And then in the 80s and 90s, they built walls, they put them up and, um, how do we go through this process and how do we create a facilities plan that is not out to revolutionize anything but thinking about evolution but also thinking like you just said about adaptability right mm -hmm. like i don't think any of us are looking for the shiny thing right no. what we want is we want spaces or at least i'm going to speak for myself i want spaces that support what we've said the strategic plan is going to do mm -hmm. right and, and we have an aggressive strategic plan and I think that we see that. And so how does all that, I don't, I don't know exactly if my question it's, is clear, but like how do we make sure we don't fall in the trap of doing things in this plan that are so aggressive that they were trendy? Right, and it's not even just the strategic plan. It's, it's the next 20, 30, 40 right. years right. beyond right. the strategic Correct. plan. Well, and again, you, and you've heard me say it. In seven years of teaching middle grades education, three different pedagogies I taught under. In seven short years, mm -hmm. so that's how rapidly we change. Um, about five years ago, somebody asked me if I could design the perfect building, what would you do? I said, I'd make a nice sized room with a lot of technology, a lot of power, and a lot of water. Honestly. I mean, think about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you've got all those kind of tools working for you, I mean, look at your innovation hubs. There's, there's not a spectacular design to them. There's practical solutions that are adaptable. Furniture, technology, resources that go into those spaces. The question that gets asked a lot of times is, do, do facilities really have an impact on educational improvement? And it's a hard question to answer. Um, and how are they become timeless? Again, uh, to your point, yeah. I can walk into any district in this country, walk into any school building with my experience, and probably come within three years of when that building was built. There's no way our buildings should be designed to know when they were built. Well, they, but need I, to, they need to get beyond that. So yeah. the, the question is, how do you do that? First of all is architecture changes. Wider span, non-load bearing, movable, that allow that to happen. The second solution is that the facility isn't the only solution. That has to be part of your equation for adaptability. Mm -hmm. 
that when I have all the online resources, I want to educate my child. If that wasn't the case, our homeschooling percentages wouldn't go up across this country. But the idea that a student has an opportunity to learn from many different sources will, should improve that, that mindset. That when I know my student can go to a community college, UC, Xavier, Dayton, and get coursework that don't require facilities demand, that's a different way of thinking. So if we're going to tie it all to facilities, then there's no good answer because I can't give you one. I don't know what the space looks like in 2040. Yeah, I think that for me, like I think about it, you can't tie, it's hard to tie facilities to a flawed report card, right? Mm -hmm. And saying that because of the facilities, the academics have improved. I think it's behavior, right? Sure. Like, so I look, I, I, there's a lot of great new buildings that have been built across the region. And I do think our board at some point should get outside sure. of our Westchester Liberty Township borders and see some of the spaces that have been created. And what you see in those spaces, again, I, I'm not saying academics have improved in those districts, but you can definitely tell behavior has changed. Mm -hmm. um, moving the teacher more into a facilitator role versus the lecture, right? Creating extended learning spaces. Um, I love, you know, one of the buildings, Reading just built their new K-12 campus, and one of the things if you go into the high school is that it mimics what a lot of businesses look like now. They've got the huddle spaces that they can work in. Um, it's flexible space and things like that. So any, anybody that works within a corporation in an office that has kind of a more open concept with the huddle space and things like that, it's starting to mimic. And so I just, I think that's a hard shift and that's a really difficult thing to articulate maybe outward to the community, um, but also, again, not creating something that 20 years down the line we're going, hey, we need another bond because we need to build walls or redesign it back to the way it was. But, you know, like but, but keep in mind also the practical things that are out there. When bad roofs, bad windows, bad walls lead to intrusion, which means bad things creep in behind the walls, increased absenteeism because of water intrusion, mold growth, all those kind of things. And when you, when you spend every other year throwing more tar on a roof to try to keep that out, at what point is that a bad investment? And so not only just the educational side, think about the practical side. Sure. Because sure. those things, you know, dark classrooms, you know, no natural daylighting, yeah. bad air quality, those are practical building things that everybody who has a building that's older than 50 years old is dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so let's not forget that, that there's two sides of that on there too. Well, so. I think too, just, you're right, the, the building is not gonna make it a better educational experience and better report card, but I was at this second vision and there was a junior high student in my group who more than once said, I can't get through the halls. She said, I'm frustrated every day because I can't literally get through the halls to get to my classroom. She said, I, and she said, and it makes my, it starts my day off bad. She goes, I can't get to my locker in between classes because she's at Liberty Junior and the halls are this narrow. Sure. And so while it doesn't impact the report card, it does impact their learning experience, I guess. And Mental health, their stress yeah, levels. She, their... she was very, the poor girl was very stressed about it still sitting in that meeting. How frustrating. Uh, I know, and I felt horrible for her. Hmm. Yeah. Can I get back to my locker in three minutes, four minutes? Right. Mm -hmm. No. <clears throat> That's stressful. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, it, sometimes it's, my, I think my easy answer to that is let me show you what a bad building can do to your educational achievement. Right. Mm. Let me show you what a bad building can do, because that's a better example. You know, if, if you have buildings that have quality spaces that are warm, safe, and dry, that are healthy, it's hard to prove. There's no question. But I kind of have the attitude is, first of all, they should reflect how we value education. Any space that you walk into should have that reflection. And, and the second thing is, is why should we have any obstacles if we can avoid them? In, within our means. If, if I could make a wider hallway for you, I would make a wider right. hallway. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's not practical. If it's not practical, and it's, if it's not within your means, those are the things that you have to pay attention to. And right. that's why I think, again, that's why I think there's such a big misperception about a facilities planning process that everybody thinks that when you get your bill at the end of the day, whatever that bill is gonna be, 300, 400, 500 million, which we're gonna tell you time and time again, you can't afford it. 
<laughs> but at what point is your do your investments investments or lack of investment and again that's not on just you guys but on anybody mean that it's going to cost more down the road mm -hmm. and so if i'm going to put 10 million in for the next 10 years with inflated costs which means i'm going to spend 120 million on school facilities but at the end of that i'm 120 million further back than i was before that's not a good investment and nobody would ever invest in that business model and so what's it take for you to maintain certainly a warm safe and dry that that should be the bottom standard but then what's it going to take then to meet those educational goals which you have established as a board to meet and then what's our means and what does that mean in our investment and look that might take five years it might take 10 years it might take 20 years that's the key to good facility planning and and i what's going to be hard in the education of most of any community is that whenever that bill comes in that we're not going to do that tomorrow. We can't yeah. do that tomorrow. Right. And I think that's the and that's a hard. I'm, look, that's hard to communicate. I think. And it sounds simple, but I'm going to tell you. I mean, you get that, like anybody, you get that big bill in the mail, and you're like, whew. And then you say, oh, I can do a payment plan. I can right. do this over I time. Can do it all that's, overnight. That's a, that's a relief for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that again, em embrace a facility plan for what it is, an investment into a roadmap of your future and how your environments are gonna support that. Um, and that's why I think a vision's about. And so when you're, when you're in that pathway and you're in that light, I think you can set at ease. Now, will you go after a referendum? Maybe, likely at some point, everybody does. You're in Ohio, right. <laughs> every district yep. does. Um, but what does that mean in the means of your community? That's what it is. Um, you know, people talk about taxes and being overtaxed and all that, but I'm gonna tell you in 20 years of doing this, I have seldom found that the dollar is the issue, if you do good planning. The dollar's an issue if you plan something that's outside the means of the district. But typically, it's really about the investment into your community and, and how you do that and how you lay it out. Um, and if you do it well, and you guys are doing it well, because you're, you're taking time to do this, you're not just throwing out a facilities master plan. You're taking real time to do this. You're involving the right people. You're going through visioning. You're working with a state agency that's been doing this a while, and that's, that's not a bad thing. You leaning on their expertise, you know, milk that as much as you can get it. Um, I think those are a lot of positives that happen in this. And these results here, now again, when we tie this into, what I'd like in your visioning document, I'd like your visioning document to be three or four pages that are very graphically and easy to understand. Then I'll give you the thick background information that you can read through for insomnia or whatever you want to do it for. Um, <laughs> But I, that's what I want to do. I want to make it clear and concise and consumable so when your community is looking at it, they can say, you know what, that makes sense to what the facility plan is going to mean to what we're going to have to invest in the future. I don't have questions, but I do have a, a yeah, few comments. Please. Mm -hmm. and, and Trace, I have to be honest with you, a big bill in the mail. I'm probably going to say more than just woo. It's, it's, that's not what I want to hear. However, mm -hmm. what I did like about what you said, um, I like the your schedule and time are not bricks and mortar. Those are strategies that you can use. As we look at things like ed choice, mm -hmm. and as a public school district, we have to consider the investment that we've made over many, many years in brick and mortar. Mm -hmm and not necessarily knowing because it could be one biennium bill or one piece of legislation that changes our entire budget stream. And so not knowing that and not knowing what the future holds, to me it does not seem like investing in additional brick and mortar, mm -hmm. taking care of what we have, but looking at other strategies. And I, I heard you talk about challenges at the same and things that we're not doing well at the same time that I heard you talking about strategies that I see opportunity in scheduling flexibility plus building usage there's an opportunity there cafeteria and soft space or student collaboration space and maybe vending machines instead of things that dictate the master schedule there's an opportunity there mm -hmm. businesses in the building great opportunity there I love all of those thoughts those are an investment in time, but not in and right. shifting what our sacred cows are. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to use an old-fashioned term, and there's there's so much potential there, and I, 
I agree completely with what Brad said about standing the test of time. I don't know that you really can build a building that mm -hmm. somebody can't date it. Yeah, yeah it's but, hard. But I get your point on it. Um, I, I, I really like that you're focusing on more than just the facility part, that that's not the only solution. And I think this has been brought home lately with everything that we're trying to deal with legislatively. So yeah, yeah. I appreciate that approach. Thanks. Did I mention I don't like the big bill? I know you don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I don't think anybody, well, I don't think anybody to your, does. To your point on the legislative, um, that uh, I got an email. This, was, this happened to be out of Alabama. I have somebody that threw me something out of Alabama that's happened in their legislation. School choice. And mm -hmm and they're starting <coughs> charter initiatives in Alabama. This is the first kind of run at it. And it's, <laughs> it's not gonna be easy because, and you know it and you've seen it, but, but the complications and the mandates that they wanna put, and we'll call them unfended mandates. How many of those do you get a year? That always been there. They're always gonna be there and they're gonna continue to come and I know that. Right. And so the, the unsurety of your funding source just adds a layer of complication to this. And so, this is why you know, when you're looking at facilities, you know, being conservative in your approach about staging and phasing and, and then reviewing, because your needs will change. Um, again, we, we, call it, um, we call it a coupled process that the data that you use to make decisions will change because of the decisions you make, which will mean you're gonna have to use a new set of data to make the next set of decisions. That is a fascinating world to be in. So to your point, when the data changes because of something that where you were forced to do or you did do, then people look back to say, well, why was that done? Right. And that's a, I think it's complicated, and, I, and I'm with you. That big bill is not what we're looking for. And I don't think any, I don't, I honestly, as good a times that I think we're in, people aren't far removed from 2011, 12, 13, when it was like nobody had anything going into that and really hit, got hit hard. So um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to contribute to always that discussion about how we do non-facility solutions to this. Because I think there's, like you said, there are opportunities. They're not challenges, there are opportunities there for us. I think, it really it's, I think it's important that the community understands too, and I, I think that they're getting this as they attend more of these meetings, is that we truly believe, or at least I believe right now, that we are a, a unique time, right? Um, we, we are at a place that we recognize the fact that we are aging our buildings. Mm -hmm. You know, those of us that lived through the Lakota boom of the eight, late 80s and 90s, huh. those buildings are getting 30 to 40 years old. And so the process that we're going through right now, and I completely agree that we need to be looking at everything, every aspect. Um, the, the place that we are now is really a forward-thinking look. It's no different than what you do with your own home. Right? When you're getting to 20 to 30 years old, you're going to be looking out and saying, what do I need to be investing in to make this thing either work long term or adjust it to better meet the needs of the future, right? How we were educating in the 90s is completely different than how we're educating now and how, what we're educating for, and I think you mentioned that. Um, and so I think that as a board, if we just continue to maintain that mindset of, um, and I, I agree, nobody wants a big sticker, but I think keeping the mindset of, Let's put the price here now and just dig deeper into those types of solutions that right. may not be brick or mortar, how we might leverage different things. And one of the conversations we've had a lot in the um, facilities committee too is land value. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the dynamics of our community recognizing the fact that Westchester Township is almost built out and we have buildings sitting on land that are aging? What does that look like? How does that play into the future? You know, what does it look like to have some of our newer schools in Liberty Township, but the growth is still happening in Liberty Township? And so I just, I, I think I like to say this every time, I just want the community, um, if they're listening and get this feeling of angst, just to hit pause for a second and just realize that we're just kind of on a journey right now. Mm -hmm. And truly we're learning and we're talking, we're exploring these different options to really get us to a place that we recognize that this is the community's largest investment, mm -hmm. right? Our schools are the largest investment and how do we maintain that investment over time or give them a return on the investment mm -hmm. right. that's not just academic, but in other ways. And so, um, all right, I'm done. <laughs> so those are, yeah, I think I say it at every meeting, don't can, I? I? Again, this is, a, this is a <laughs> half day <laughs> discussion about, but when you're talking about, <laughs> uh, we're talking about school districts in Southern California about six or seven years ago when the first kind of big fires were happening that we can recall in the news, right? And 
because of technology, they were going to a zero absenteeism policy, which means you don't have to be in school to get some objectives met. Mm -hmm. And so, why, so I'll go personal again. My daughter, volleyball, because she has a three-day term on the weekend, doesn't excuse her from getting her objectives met on the Friday classwork that she's doing. Now, does she have the direct instruction of the teacher? You know what? In a lot of cases, she does because they live stream, they, they record, they, they have their notes, they have their presentations. Mm -hmm. So my daughter's getting an absentee day on a report card, although she met every objective of every class because she got it in. That's zero ab absenteeism. So moving towards a zero ab absenteeism policy because you can. Now, there's, there's times you can't when kids are truly down and shouldn't be doing anything, right? But that's an opportunity to think about. And you know what? It's funny that states like Alaska are forced to do it because of geography and location and circumstance. States like Southern California, the volcanoes of Hawaii, there are states that are forced to do it. They've been doing this stuff for yeah. years because they have to. And, and they work. You know, it's, it's awesome to do an interview in Alaska because you don't have to travel. Mm -hmm. Every one of them will do them online. That's a great interview. You know? <laughs> um, so I'd just like to that point, Alaska. I think right? just continuing our exploration, I love the way you put it. It's an exploration about those opportunities that you can have yeah. and, um, <coughs> and what you can implement. Great. Any other? Wednesday. Thoughts? Wednesday night. Six o'clock. I'm yep. sorry to mean the your thunder. Mm -hmm. I it was good information. It was good to get feedback from other groups that you met. And I love the idea about less transitions for kids. I mean, you hit that a little bit, but I mean, I, that's something I've heard a lot. For years. Yep. I think you'll have better control of your ability to control class size, resource staffing, um, by having a larger grade span, mm -hmm. um, because you're gonna have cohorts that come in that are big. Mm -hmm. Like right now, your first and second grade are pretty big classes, but those aren't always gonna be that way. Right, they drop off. Right. Um, so you're gonna feel that, but those wider grade spans will allow you to f flex your buildings better, because I just don't have two or three grades in them, and I get, oh my gosh, I got two big classes, so we're too crowded this year, oh, I need 10 portables. And then you can never get rid of the portables because everybody wants to keep their portables regardless. Mm. So you're, you're doing all that. Yeah, you don't have portables, but, but that's a case. <laughs> <Yeah>. Nope. <laughs> so I think there's They're huge gone. benefits to being able to control all of that and just yeah. be better at your resourcing with that. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. The only other updates we have right now is um, we met with the OFCC about 10 days ago. We went through all the assessments, and we are still working through that process. Um, it was pretty enlightening. Jenny was there. Uh, the the um, architect team was there. And basically, we were going through every building, and um, we had submitted some data to them saying, hey, here's some things that we've done to improve our buildings. Felt pretty good about um, to come back and say, hey, no, that doesn't really meet the new design manual. You guys are doing great things of keeping your buildings and making them more efficient, but it doesn't meet the design manual, <coughs> so we won't be able to count that towards an improvement. And one easy example was um, LED lighting. We've gone through and put LED lighting light bulbs in all of our buildings, but we did not replace the ballast sort of fixture itself. And in the new design manual, it needs a certain type of ballast and fixture, so that would not qualify as a um, upgrade under the uh, facilities design manual. But it's something that we're doing that needed to be done, and it's the right thing to do. Yes, yeah, the right, the right thing, thing to do. To do. But yep. just little things like that as we work through this process, we're finding out that. It may look good and, and be the right thing to do, but it may not qualify for the design manual. Um, sure. Cost, right. So, okay. Chris, can uh, you give us a summary of those things that you know of? Oh yeah, and yeah, we're going through that right now. We're still going back and forth. Hey, will this count? Will that count? Will this count? Will that count? So uh, we'll have a, a final list that we'll. It'll be, be able updated to compared to our old. Correct. Correct. That we have. Okay. Correct. Yep. And which again will be changed in April because they update all their numbers again. In oh April. my goodness. Oh. Yep. We'll look forward to it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, so at this point, you don't know of any of the schools whether they've changed their status? Not right now, no. No, we don't. So we're going through that piece. We've got the enrollment piece back. Um, we're going through and looking at that. I have some questions about a few different areas um, compared to the one that we had done a couple of years ago. Um, they're pretty identical through the first five years, and they sort of divert, and one goes up and one goes back down. So trying to look through that and see what questions we have about that. 
but for the first five years, there are 30, 30 students total apart. So okay. we'll get through that and see where we end up with that. So that's where we are right now in the other two aspects. Okay. Anything else I missed, Jim? That was it. Great. Any other questions for either nope. Tracy or Chris? All right, well, we'll move on to our public comment section um, of the meeting. If there's anybody that would like to speak, you can go up to the podium, please. All right, seeing no one, then we will move to adjourn the meeting. Do I have a motion? So I'll move. Oh. <laughs> Don't get too excited. All right, I'll <laughs> second then. Jenny? Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mrs. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Lovell? Yes. Thank you all. Oh, Taff. I don't have my gavel. Yeah. I don't know. Um, thank, thank you all for coming out, out this evening. <laughs>